What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Club Import Cars and Chatter Podcast. Uh, we're here again at the beautiful Straight Auto Body Shop. And uh, just want to give a big shout out to them for allowing us to use the space again. But before we do get started, I do have an announcement to make. Um, we decided to partner up with uh, South Bay. Um, South Bay Auto Works. Auto Works. Keep forgetting that part. South Bay Auto Works. So anytime you guys want to purchase something, you can go in there, use the um, code Club Import. I'll put it on the screen for you guys to kind of take a look at. And uh, you guys get an automatic 10, 15% off. There's no limit as to how many items you can buy with that discount. But, you know, hey, it's something for literally nothing. But, uh, again, thank you again, Straight Auto Body Shop, South Bay Auto Works, code name uh, Coupon, Club Import. Today we have Paul. Welcome, Paul. What's up, guys? How you doing? Good, good. And, of course, Caesar. Hello, everybody. He uh, Caesar was on vacation, guys. So I just want to put put it out there. We didn't record anything because of him. I was out of town. Yeah. Hey, it must be nice. I mean, you, it can, was you great. work hard. You got to play hard. Exactly. Too. I don't go that often. Don't even start with that. Okay. Do, do we have to mention what you work on? It's still working hard. Is it a desk job? No. Okay, then. I mean, it kind of qualifies for well earned time off. See, it, thank it, you. It, no, I don't consider holding. I job. don't. Oh, that's an awesome job, though, man. <laughs> I mean, technically, wouldn't you be wouldn't you be considered a support system at that point? There we go. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Hey, listen. You know, my job entails of me sitting down most of most of my time and then driving most of my time. So, I but can't it's really stressful because you have to interact with humans. That's the part I love. My okay. human. So it's great. Yeah, his his so humans are mine aren't, and majority of the time they think they know exactly what they're saying, mm. and that never works out. No, I no, can never doesn't. work retail. But. Uh, Paul, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us what you do and uh, all that good stuff. I know you and I go back for a while, so. Yeah, I mean, um, so my name is Paul. I own a uh, performance and maintenance shop in Silmar, California called PK Auto Design. Um, we predominantly cater to the uh, aftermarket uh, high-performance American muscle platform. Okay. So, uh, you know, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, the big three. Mm -hmm. um, I, myself, am a, a big Ford specialist. Um I, I get this all the time. People ask me, you know, what school did I go to? I am self-taught. Okay. Uh, YouTube? Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> YouTube Google, University. <laughs> Google, Google helps out a lot. I think Google outranks YouTube nowadays uh, on certain. Um, actually, no, YouTube. The forums actually. outranks YouTube. everything. Well, yeah. the, the forums are actually considered an informational website, so they always rank in the top three whenever you search on a search engine. Really? Uh, that so I'll get into that w with you guys on on what the the crucialness of automotive forum is itself and, and how that benefits the aftermarket industry for us. Um, but yeah, I, I do pretty much everything and anything to do with maintenance on the car and to modify the vehicle as well. Now I get it's a bit of a gray zone in, in the wonderful state of California that we, we reside in, but there is procedures that we follow. Um, so, you know, street going cars have to stay within the carb limitations that we have to follow so that my door stays open and I'm not, only making something for myself and my wife, right? But mm -hmm. to be able to um, support the families that I hire in the sense of like the, the team that I have, right? Each team, each team member that I have, and I don't call them employees. I don't like that term. Um, Smart man. And, and I don't even like them when they call me boss, even as a joke. Uh, I'm just, I work with them as a team. I'm a team member. They're a team member. But, you know, each person that I have that, that works alongside me is a family that has to, they have to support and so for the doors to stay open, I have to follow certain guidelines. Now, we do build race cars, like legitimate trailered in, trailered out cars that that go and see track time at a circuit, um, autocross, or a drag strip. And those cars we play really hard with. I mean, we do insane things on those cars. And it's definitely fun. Um, but, yeah, that, that's kind of what we do. We do Everything to do with the motor, uh, transmission, driveline, suspension, roll cages. I mean, there's a lot of growth that's been going on for the past year within the company. Um, and I can definitely explain it uh, further. It just gets a little super geeky, and I'm, I'm into that. So if I give you a headache, warn me. Geek out, man. All right. Geek out <laughs> as much as you want, brother. So, um, you know, uh, if you want a little background on, on, on myself, how Absolutely. I started... I know you and me go back in the days where I was an adolescent in the sense of like a youngster with my first car, modifying it. You know, I, I had that Honda 
And uh, I had a four-door automatic four-cylinder Honda Accord. Wow. Right? And um, I, it was a 2008 model. So when, when, the, when that sixth gen, uh, was it a sixth or an eighth gen? Sixth gen. Sixth gen came out. I took that car and I lowered it on coilovers and I did my own big brake kit conversion with, you know, Acura RL calipers and Nissan 350Z Nismo rotors. And, you know, we, we built the bracket and made the big brake kit work because I was balling on a budget. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, fenders and, and I did the Plasti Dip and the exhaust. And I, I built a lot of the stuff myself in my, my driveway. My old man would come out and be like, what the hell are you doing to this thing? And I'm like, modifying it. And, you know, as Middle Eastern parents car is meant to go from point a to point b and you're <laughs> supposed to go to school with it or you know a job and that's it and with me it was it was more right i've always as a child had this itch to want to tinker my dad had an engineering background and he stepped out of that and got into finances and paperwork and stuff and with me i had that bug to always just play with things i mean when i was young my grandfather would make me work with him in the carpentry little shop that he had right so i always had this knack for working with my hands and um, it led into cars now Obviously, as we know, cars are a really expensive hobby to get into. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's not even get into that. <laughs> uh, if my wife knew how much money I've spent on cars. Um, Let's not get into yeah, that subject. Yeah, that would be a very deep conversation. I, mean, I, I honestly can't say I've spent much, but let's not get into it. it, it like, to each their own, right? Um, the way I look at it is, is a car is a few things. One, it's the second largest investment that an individual ever does besides purchasing a house. Okay, It is factorially... Uh, purchasing a car yep and um, for myself and i know for you and for you as well a car isn't just something to go from point a to point b and sit in it you know it's it's a it's a statement of your personality it's it saves you in a certain sense right Mm -hmm. so for for myself and for for a lot of my clients a car is something that that's where you can vent you can work on your thing right You, you, you can tinker you you had a bad day you go home and you want to get down in the garage and you want to work on the car, even if it's just like something simple doing an oil change, right? It can get your mind off of some of the darkest things that ever occur within your brain. And, and that's the way I look at it. You know, uh, yes, I own a business. Yes, we have to make money to survive. I have to put food on my table, support my wife, right? Pay my mortgage, my health insurance, my bills. But, and I still say this a lot to, to a lot of my new coming clients, money is always secondary to me. Being able to have that personal interaction with my clients is always more important to me. That's my number one thing. I want my clients to trust me. I want them to be able to, to feel good dropping off this really expensive investment on four wheels. Now, two wheels every once in a while, right? But predominantly four wheels. Yep. And and for them to leave the shop with comfort within, within them that the job that's going to be done is going to be done appropriately. And, you know, the, the main thing with it, and I know I might be, skewing around a little bit and I do apologize we're playing with someone's life you know uh, maybe some shops don't think of it that way no but it's but, true. but no. simple thing you do a brake change mm-hmm. and if you don't set the brake pads properly or set the rotor properly right you can hurt someone let alone people around with that you know and and not only physically you do something wrong on a car and that car goes south it blows up Right, high horsepower drag car, and it pops. The motor just goes. No one gets hurt. That man that owns that car now is in the deepest hole mentally. He's depressed. He's sad. A man or a woman is depressed. They're sad. Their pride and joy is hurt. That's like seeing your child fall and get a cut to a lot of people. Yep. You know, and so um, I take it to the utmost. Uh, like ability, humanly, and even sometimes I fail because I feel like I haven't. I can't obtain that that level of perfection. Knowing that as a human, you can't be perfect, yeah, yeah. right? But you try, try always, well, myself or my team, to to gain that level of perfection, knowing it's unattainable, but still striving for it, right? So that was the off-tangent part, and I do apologize for that. Oh, you're fine. You but, don't need um, to apologize. That's what we're here for, you know? Everybody should talk. have that mentality. It's a great yeah. mentality it, to It's have. a mentality that... Um, let's touch base on that for a second, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one quick thing. So the whole Honda thing, right? So I, I built this Honda and uh, I, I want to go with the wheels. And I'm telling you how I started within this industry because everyone has a starting point, right? Yeah. A catalyst. Yeah. 
And so um, I have this Honda, and, and at that time I was into the whole slammed and super camber setup, and I'm talking like five degrees, six degrees, pull your fenders, roll Jesus. the hair out of your beard, <laughs> like crazy stuff, stretch tires to the point where you're like, there's no tire left. Right, so life. Yes. Well, ricer and, and stance is kind of different, right? Um, so what I did is we're at straight auto body, right? And so coming down here today, I'm like, wait, this street looks really familiar. My first point of employment ever within the automotive industry is less than 100 feet away from here. Yeah. All right? And we were I, just talking about that. Yeah, we were. And uh, I worked for this gentleman as a sales guy. So I, I did sales, and um, one thing led to another. The way I met him was I wanted to buy a set of wheels, and I said, hey, these are the wheels. They were 20 by 10 and a half. Um, I don't know if the company's still around, but Concept One's. CS ones, if I'm not mistaken, think, was the model. Yeah, concept is still all around. Are they? I think so. I haven't, I haven't sold a set of those wheels since I left and started my own thing. But I had, I had these big flat lip, uh, one piece cast concept one mesh wheels. That was like my thing. And I remember we, them. And the reason why I did those is because I couldn't afford the avant garde forge wheels at the time. I, I was really balling on a budget. They were like fifty five hundred dollars at that time in two thousand and eleven. Um, and I couldn't afford it, so I, I, I picked up a set of concept ones, and I loved it, and I, I did the setup, and, and one thing led to another, and my former employer turns around and goes, hey, you know, what do you do for a living? I said, I slang refrigerators at Sears and Burbank, <laughs> you know, and I was making pretty good money for a 20-year-old, 20, 20 21-year-old kid, and he goes, well, what do you think about the automotive industry? And like, boom, the light bulb light goes bulb. off, and I'm like, I would love to, so I give my two-week resignation, whole letter thank you so much for the opportunities here at sears Burbank, california thank you so much i'm out bye guys and i go and i start working over here and i sucked at it like for six months i was like ramen noodle kind of lunch and <laughs> dinner situation and uh, then i progressively found my niche and and the niche i had was automotive forums yeah. so what i would do is i'm a i'm not a good salesman all right and i don't say that i'm a good salesman the way that I have always been able to be successful at what I do is by being straight and upfront and blunt, right? So I got onto these forums. The company wanted to do the forum whole situation. So I go on the forums. I had been on forums before we all had as, as younger people. And uh, I get in really good with these communities. And, and what I would do is I would find out what their wants and their needs are, right? And I would help either with getting a wheel product that was about to get launched. And then, you know, my old former employer would make a deal where it was exclusive for six months or a year through the company and we would sell it. Now would be the sales guy. And that's how I made my money. Obviously, once again, going back to the basic foundation, you have to make money to survive. Absolutely. I had to, I had to make money to feed my addiction to cars. Right. Um, and, and that's a very expensive hobby to want to get into. All right. And it can get Don't even it. more expensive. <laughs> no, do it. Um, but within your means, yeah, you know, like true. this whole affirm situation that I see nowadays and snap and affirm, sad. I'm just like, look, we offer it at my company. Um, but I, I, before I offer it, I tell my customers, this is the truth behind it. They sugarcoat it for you. But like, this is the reality after 90 days, your soul is theirs. They will make double the amount. So if you buy something for $3,000 within the period of you doing your biweekly payments, you pay another $3,000 in interest. Yeah. So you double paid for that product. If you can affirm it, pay it off in the first 90 days because then you don't have any interest that you have to pay for or SNAP or Progressive or whatever the, the financing uh, institution is that's being utilized. So that I tell my customers, dude, you want to do it? No problem. But in 90 days, pay it off. Pay it completely off. Save yourself the hassle. I don't like having payments. Needless to say, I have a car payment, health insurance every month, and a mortgage in HOA, right? Other than that, I don't have any other payments. I don't like that concept of having monthly payments. Um, so I'm really honest with, with the customers, right? So 2016, I leave. I open up my company. And um, I know you remember this. I, I opened it up. I, you had never really, had you come to the shop? Never been to okay. the shop, no. Well, the first shop was a 2,800 square foot, single bay, I built my own little office, barely had any money to really do what I needed to do, right? I, I took all the money that I had. I borrowed some money from my brother. I borrowed some money from my dad. And um, I buy the, the Hunter Revolution Mounter and Hawk, um, and Laser um, mm. Balancer, right? Because I was like, I'm going to do wheels and tires. And I'm going to do suspension, right? I never fathomed that in seven years I would be building cars, mm. right? And um, so I, I did that. And I mean... 
I didn't even have money for tables or chairs. I, <laughs> I had borrowed party tables from my dad and uh, folding chairs, like the old school metal folding chairs. Oh, yeah. And that's what I was using. So I would be on the forums and I would be working and I had a few guys working with me, right? And, and we, would, we would sell stuff. And then at night, I would mount and balance the wheels and package them and then we would ship them. Mm. So I, I was busting, you know, 18 hour, 20 hour days when I first started. And, and we offered the option to, to, you know, install the wheel in house. So like the customer would come, we would put it on the lift and we'd install the wheels and check everything. And then boom, done. Um, and I taught myself how to use the machine. There's no formal training for that, that, uh, that like autonomous. And I put that in quotations, autonomous mounter or dismounter. Um, and so, you know, we built the reputation. So I still remember this. November the 1st, 2016 was my first sale for my company. It was a set of 20-inch avant-garde M615s in gloss red with a set of Nitto Invo tires for an F10 BMW 535i. And the reason why I remember this is because I was so excited that I did my first sale. Nice. Like, like I, to the point where emotionally I wanted to cry because I was like, this is it. I have my responsibilities as a business owner now. I have to fulfill them. I personally delivered that set to a body shop in North Hollywood. No shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which body shop? I don't remember, uh, but they were on Langersham, but there's a million of them uh, there. No, Langersham is like body shop central. Yeah. So I just remember that I went there and I met the guy and I said, hey, I'm personally delivering. I drove all the way to Santa Fe Springs to Avant Garde. I picked up the wheels. I, I picked up the tires and then I drove all the way to North Hollywood and I personally delivered it. So the guy didn't have to pay for any shipping. Nice. He just paid for the wheels and the tires and the sensors tax and that was it and a free delivery that was the, my first order and i still remember it like as if well, i had my brother with me i took mm. my younger brother with me he's like oh, i'm gonna drive and i'm like all right dude just drive the car and i'll give you the direction so we made this whole day trip at the time and, and went and fulfilled our first order for the customer and i was like all right cool this is it like let's get back proud to it moment. it was a really proud moment and you know it just instilled more hunger within me to to succeed um not to prove a lot of people that thought that I wasn't going to be able to do it wrong, but more so um, to myself. Mm -hmm. I, I like challenging myself. It's a mental game, and that's also one of the reasons why I've lost my hair. <laughs> but it's definitely I'm catching something. catching up to you, don't worry. Yeah. Well, no, you still got a head full uh, of hair. It's, it's, I'm thinning up out here. Okay, thinning is one thing. Being a glass mirror on the top of your skull is another, you know? I'm getting there. Ah, you still got hair. You're good. Um, yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's kind of the whole start of it. And then you know, one thing led to another, and some people asked, "Hey, can can you uh, can you put big brake kits on?" I said, "Yeah." And then, "Hey, can you uh, install a clutch for me?" And and all the work I I, I do, I'm not going to say 100 percent of it because I, I have had mentors throughout this journey of owning this company, right? And I, I'll never take away from those people that had been more than willing to share knowledge that takes years to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a lot of it's self-taught. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but that's the beauty part of it, right? Well, I shouldn't say beauty because a lot of people don't do what you do. You know, they'll learn something from somebody and then say, oh, I did it. I'm self-taught and I did everything by myself. Nobody helped me out, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, you're sitting here, you're being honest about it. You're saying that others helped you throughout this journey. And that's the beauty of life because others have to be there no matter what you do. 100% I agree with it. I mean, um, th there's a philosophy that, that I have. The industry that we're in, as ever much so as we are attacked now. Right? Oh, yeah. And and I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys have dived into that and such, but you guys know what's going on with the industry. They're, they're really trying to kill us. Mm -hmm. and, and not physically, but, but our livelihood, the way that we make a living for ourselves. But imagine that it's a pie, all right? There's enough pie for everyone to have a slice of it. There is enough, even for my competition, that is on the other side of the Valley Ridge in a different county, all right, which I, I, don't, I, I don't care about my competitions, right? It, I, the only competition I have formally and, and, and truly within my head is me. Yeah. I, I woke up at 6 this morning. Well, what am I going to do tomorrow to beat myself today? What am I going to gain tomorrow that I didn't do today? And, and progressively push myself every day. And I mean, my wife hates it because I am uh, an old true definition of workaholic. I love working, but I love working with my hands. And the payoff is the customer's happy. Now, yeah, once again, make something, right? But the, the, 
the joy you get from when you see this dream that this customer had in their head, whatever it is, a simple thing, set of wheels, to a massive thing, building a car from front bumper to rear bumper, every single thing modified, changed to the highest of standards, and thousands, of tens of thousands of dollars being invested into producing this dream for this customer. And it's done however long, three months, six months, a year, year and a half, two years. And you give the keys to the customer and go, hey, let's go for a drive real quick, right? Or let's take it to the track and let's go test it. And the customer sees it run a number or run a trap speed, right? Or if it's a street legal application and it's smooth and buttery and it drives great, but it has amazing oomph to it, right? And you see that smile on that customer, that's the payoff. Mm -hmm. That to me is the emotional gratification, that I get. I think that's worth more than anything else. I mean, don't get me wrong, money is always good, but that's the high. Yeah. That 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 is the high that I I I chase. Mm -hmm. You know, is is taking something that someone imagined like in that magazine right there, right? And producing it for that customer. And I'm not saying it for a sob reason. I'm truly saying in the sense of like look at the greats within this industry, right? There's multiple of them. If we're talking in the Armenian community, which is quite small within this industry if you really think about it yeah all right you got the platinum brothers yep okay you got the rdb guys yep. which i don't know them that well but i bumped into them a lot of people don't know this but toys R auto in canada is an Armenian guy named avo hmm. all right in quebec i believe all right look at his story and and i look at these guys or or like my buddy gev uh, gev power right he's he's in my opinion the caddy king anything to do with v2 ctsvs LS Motors, this guy is the great. I look at him as inspiration, and I consider him to be a brother, right? His quality is so high. His push for perfection is so high. And I look at him and go, if I can push myself to be like these people, not in the sense of taking the throne, I don't care about that, but more in the sense of quality, quality, right? The reputation you build and the lasting memories that you build within this industry is based off the quality, not the not the amount of money you make. The money money is su superficial. It's going to go. You, you spend it, it's gone. You die. Your family takes money. Okay, great, but Paul is no longer here. Mm -hmm. PK either stays on as a legacy company, right, and say my offsprings carry on within the name or it disappears, as, as unfortunate as some companies do, right? But what lasts the work that you did with these hands. Oh, I'm sorry. I went like this and I know there's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> People are probably still confused about that whole thing. <laughs> but, but it's, it's okay. I'll bloop it out for uh, you, uh, please. It, it, it's, it's the work. It's the work, the, 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 the cars, right? And, and so, you know, uh, you guys probably share this. Cars are moving artwork. All right. As, as simple as something as a kid putting a front lip on their car to as uh, exceptional as a Boyd Coddington built vehicle or a Jesse James hot rod, for instance, right? I mean, look at what Jesse James does. This guy's branched off into a million things, firearms, cu uh, culinary oh. knives, oh. ammunition, coffee, everything. But look at the work that he produces. It is so visually gratifying. And I understand I'm not in that world. Automotive world is split into multiple factors. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hot rods, your restoration companies, your um, luxury brands, right? Uh, Off-roading. Um, Off-roading, uh, track usage, street usage, circuit, et cetera, right? Wheels and tires, all that kind of stuff, vinyl wrap, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's enough, once again, pie for everyone to have a slice. In the world that I'm in, which is the performance adrenaline enthusiast community, all right? And I, I, I use the word enthusiast very lightly because um, it, it's thrown out a lot. Yep. You know, a lot of people use it, but now they're using it as a kind of like a sales pitch. And it drives me nuts. Like, stop using enthusiast as a sales pitch. An enthusiast is someone that truly looks at it and goes, hey, I'm off on Saturday. I'm going to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to get myself a nice cup of coffee, hopefully black, no cream, no sugar, right? That's how I drink mine. And go on a drive. Two hours. No music. Or music. And and you just, like, going up to Angeles, like Newcomb's Ranch, Right. And that like sad to see it go. Uh, you know what? I just found out that it, it it's it, it's no longer around, and and I I was broken a little bit about it. You know. Uh, now imagine every single car guy like you, Caesar, myself, come together, put our money together, and make something of that. I, I mean, you know what? We should do GoFundMe. 
and bring it back? I think, why not? Look, you remember the Nukem days, oh, right? Of course. Do you? I do. And I mean, I was an adolescent numbskull back then. You know, there's there's rules to the road up there. And, and unfortunately, even more so now, people feel like they're Superman and they're invincible. But like, even with that, like, once you were done, that that's a different side of the conversation. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole thing with it was like, you would go on your, your you know, some people call it a Sunday morning drive, right? But yeah. like, say Saturday morning drive. And then you, you go and you grab a sandwich and some coffee and then you're hanging out. And it was like this big community gathering, right? People you'd never met in your life before. And then you would turn around and you would be like, hey, you know what? Like, nice car, man. And then you would talk and then you yeah. would bond. Like, it, that it takes. <laughs> that's that community friendship. And, and unfortunately, when you, when you lose iconic places like that within the car community, it kind of fractures that community a little bit. Because, like, well, let's be honest. We used to go to car meets, right? Panda meet. Oh. So you remember those? You know, I was going to bring it up, but then I was like, let me keep it on down for a little bit. Oh, did I spoil something? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm we'll sorry. get to it. Okay. Um, but like, you know, like the the car scene now, and I've, I've, I've been listening to your podcast uh, since I knew you guys were doing it. Like when, you know, Sipon had mentioned it and I was like, hey, you know, I really want to listen to this podcast a little bit. So I did. And, you know, the, 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 the misinformation, and I truly consider it misinformation, is as follows. We are... The car community. Yeah. Right? What people see now on the 10 o'clock news, what they see on the streets, that's all bullshit. Oh, now, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm cussing and, and you got to... Oh, you, could, you could cuss as much as you okay. want. That, that's sorry, Caesar's mom. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, all, that's all bullshit. Right? That, that is not a representation... Of the car community. Of us as a car community. Okay? Law-abiding citizens where our passion is... You know, some people go buy firearms. Some people buy culinary knives, right? Some people buy expensive shoes and watches. And don't get me wrong, that's cool. But for me, my fix is the car. Yep. My fix is hanging out with people that are like-minded like myself, um, either by fellow shop owners or other, you know, people that are in, in car enthusiasts, right? True car enthusiasts that they put their hard-earned time and money into this thing. And this thing is their pride and joy. And they're not going to go throw this thing around the street and bang it and, you know, scream and... Let's not get into it. Well, I will tell you this. I have a policy in my shop. Okay. And I mentioned this only a few times because I've only had to enact it twice in the seven years of owning my company. If I know that a car that I was involved in is going and sliding or sideshowing or whatever the hell it's called, they're banned for life from my shop. Oh, I love it. They're banned. That's how it I should be. I do not, I don't condone it. Uh, I think I might be saying that wrong. Uh, I do I don't appreciate it, right? I don't accept it. They are not of us. They're not within my community. They are not my client. I don't want your money. I don't want your time. I don't want to give you information. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to recognize you. Because what you're doing is so detrimental to families. Forget businesses. To the families within those businesses. We will lose our way of living because of it. We are losing our way of living. It's already started, unfortunately. Yeah. We're fighting against it. You know, we're, we're it, right in, in the proper avenues of fighting, right? Um, both EPA regulations, law enforcement regulations. I 100% I support Leo's, okay? Yep. A lot of my clients are You Leo's. might want to phrase what a Leo is because a lot of people won't know. Oh, a, a law, uh, Leo is a law enforcement agent, all right? L-E-O. So one of my best friends is a Leo, okay. all right? I work on his race car. Nice. Like he has a badass race car mustang and and we're building it you know i mean it's built but like right now for instance my fabricator he's working on a six point roll cage like oh full decked roll cage in there sandwich plated the whole nine yards like gutted but like we're going for a 116 at at the uh, racetrack mm. which is technically should be the record for an s550 without going to like a gt3 class car right um so a lot of my clients are law enforcement agents. They are military, former and or currently active. I'm tied in to law enforcement in the sense of I take care of their personal vehicles, right? And we have these conversations all the time. I've met guys that um, that pull people over for like, I guess the term is sliding or, or side showing, right? And, and it's just, it's a joke, man. Like you are putting, first off, you look like a joke doing that. 
all right? You think you're cool, you look like a joke. I don't care. Someone can come and argue with me in person. I will argue back. You're talking to someone that originally kind of wanted to go to law school, so I'm good with debates. But um, the main the main issue is, like, as a car enthusiast perspective, you're putting so much hell on that car, I want to cry. And some of these cars are, like, beat to ever-living crap. Like, oh, I'm a car guy. No, you're not. You you JB welded and duct taped your shit together. You know? Muffler the leak. Muffler the leak. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't get me started yeah, on that. We all started somewhere, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't like that. That's the policy I have. If I know that someone's sliding their car, they're not. If they came in so much for an oil change or a brake pad swap, and or tires, right? And and I find out that that car's being slide sliding or side showing or whatever, they're banned for life from the shop. I, your money's no good. I, I respect I, that. I don't, I don't want it. You don't want your name tied to some. Hell no, I don't. I mean, once again, the the industry that we're in. We appreciate it. A lot of people don't understand it. We're seen as black sheep. Unfortunately, they think that we're building these highly illegal race cars to go and street race in the middle of the night. And oh my God, unfortunate accidents. Yes, you know what? Street racing has its its its, it's been around for a very. It's long been time. around longer than you, me, or Caesar have had a driver's license. Absolutely, since the fifties. Yeah. I mean. Technically, if you really want to put it in consideration, back in the original T model, A model cars, someone got a speeding ticket for doing six miles an hour. I mean, if you want to consider that street racing, that's street racing, <laughs> right? But but street racing was like kind of a catalyst for for my obsession of cars, right? Uh, and I'm not admitting of anything of any sorts, but I'm saying that there's a time and place for everything. Absolutely, right? Um, and you want a street race. You got to find a place to do it. That's safe, right? And, and I get it. That's the adrenaline rush that, that like, I'm breaking a few little rules and making it happen. And I, I, I can't say no because, look, at the end of the day, a human will be a human and a human will do what they want. But slide sliding a car, side showing a car is not one of them, man. No. It's not. You put so much hell on the car. You beat the crap out of it. You look like a joke. You make us look bad. And then you wonder why everyone's cracking down on people that simply have a modified exhaust. You, you can't know, do anything these days. Here, you can't. I mean, technically, if you really want to think about it, and I, I'm, if if I'm incorrect, please, if there's any Leo that's watching this, tell me I'm wrong. Probably there is. Okay, that's fine. Um, so much as modifying the wheels on your car, technically within the California, like yeah, the Department right. of Vehicles is illegal. Seriously? Any 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 modification to a car outside yeah. of how it comes from the dealership is considered illegal. So I know that there is a certain rule when it comes to wheels. It, the diameter, the width, the height, et cetera, et cetera. If it exceeds a, a, a certain number, mm -hmm. whether it's the width or the height, it's technically considered illegal. Mm -hmm. Even lights. Like if you lower a car and the car, I think is like, if the center line of the head. Four inches. Is it? Four inches. Yeah. If your bumper, the bottom edge of your bumper is off the ground, lower than, uh, is Less than four. Less than four? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean... They can tow your car. Thank God for bags. Up we go. <laughs> Don't get me started on bags, man. I know you... I, I, I know... <laughs> I used to install bags. Hey, listen, crack control car. <laughs> Leave bags alone, Seriously. okay? <laughs> oh, look, 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 look. Air, air ride's cool. I, I'm a dealer and an installer for airlift, all right? So so I, I know all about air suspension. I stopped doing it because there's been a lot of quality issues that I've been running into where fittings were bad or products were bad and it was, it was causing headaches. And I was like, look, man, for me to make up for this, I have to charge so much more and no one's going to pay me for it. So I kind of went like, if someone's willing to pay me and then uh, for my time that will be invested to do it oh so properly, not a problem. Someone doesn't want to pay me because that's another problem with this industry is everyone Absolutely. thinks that things are cheap. Yep. First off, on record, I'm $150 an hour starting shop, right? And it's not because I'm saying it to be pricey or elegant or anything. The The investment in time, the investment in tools, the investment in knowledge oh, yeah. deems $150 an hour, right? Yeah. Shops have an overhead. Uh, Absolutely. Look, uh, within, yeah, within the shop, all yeah, that I mean, I'll put it this way. My shop is a lean and mean concept, right? I got an office manager, myself, owner, operator, main builder, and a fabricator. There's three of us. And, and an administrator, right? And he, all he does is make sure that money going in, money going out, 
what bills got to be paid, et cetera. So technically four of us. There's four of us for, for a shop, but there's only two of us working on the cars physically. Every once in a while when I need an extra pair of hands, I'll call the guys from the office. They'll come and give me a hand. But there's, there's two of us, right? Well, do you think I'm paying these guys with peanuts is the, con- is the question. No, they have a livelihood. Mm-hmm. And that livelihood costs. And because of that, there's the pay. Now, it's kind of nice that I'm also in a specialty field. I'm very good at what I do. I will give myself that credit and pat myself on the back and say, I am damn good at what I do. I am human. I make mistakes like anyone else. But 99.9% of the time, you can't beat me. At, at, the, at my craft, on that platform, I'm good. I know what's the right parts. I know what's the right companies to deal with. All right? And the job's going to be done right the first time. And I don't care if you want your car right now. My job is to make sure that your car lives a very long life. Because you might turn around and tell me, I baby it. I know you're going to beat the snot out of it. <laughs> All right? And if it breaks, who's the first person they're going to point at? Mm. They're going to come and see Baldy over here. And they're going to say, hey, it broke. Well, either, you know, say a mistake in installation or a product quality problem or user error. 99.9% of the time, user error. So we, we charge accordingly for those things. Um, so, yeah. I mean, 150 is not bad. You're able to back up what you charge. It's like there's companies charging more and they don't back it up. So yeah. You're able to back it up. That's what matters. I'll, I'll tell you so much, but I, I won't name out shops, but I know a lot of the dealerships here in SoCal just got a raise as far as their hourly rate goes. I know some shops that are starting to charge about 240, 250 an hour. So 150 an hour is not bad. I mean, you can walk into a shop, any shop, mom and pop shop, and tell them you need, you know, uh, springs installed, they'll tell you 200 bucks, but that 200 bucks doesn't guarantee your car is going to sit on it when it comes down. 200 bucks might have you uh, launching that spring across the street, you know? Um, I mean, talking about springs, this is, I was driving over here and I, I just remembered something and I, I kind of shocked myself from 2016 when I started the company till now, 2023, I've probably done well into the thousands in just lowering spring installs and uh, no joke. I'm not saying it in an exaggeration. Let's talk Mustangs, right? So there's a specific procedure when you're doing a Mustang install. The fronts are pretty straightforward. They're a McPherson strut, spring on strut, pull it out, make sure you don't damage anything, put it back together. The rear, you have to kind of partially drop the subframe side to side to do Mm -hmm. it. When I first did my first spring install, it took me four hours. Not bad, but four hours. Now I've gotten it down to an hour and a half on a slow day, maybe two hours on a slow day, right? But it's through time. But even with that quality, everything gets torqued back to factory or manufacturer spec. There is no tighten it, a one or two ucka duck is called it a day and hope to God, you know, he's a believer in the higher ups, you know, that, yeah, that I can't kind go any of, tighter. I think we're good. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Everything is too spec. I mean, the investment in tools alone, mm-hmm. um, you know, I got tools and it's taken a lot of time to amass those tools, uh, torque wrenches, specialty wrenches, screwdrivers, you name it. I have it. And the newest tool I actually picked up was a dyno. I saw that. Oh, I was going nice. to say congratulations yeah, on that. Seven years, man. I, I, um, I've always wanted one. And I had to either, you know, uh, go to a closed road, closed circuit, and, and, and do the calibration work there. Or I had to rent a dyno, which means I had to be based off of their, the, the facility's time. And I like waking up early. You know, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm up like a, like, I'm just up. Let's go. You know, the sun's coming out. There's, let's just get it done. And then work till the sun comes down. And then, you know what? That's a hard-earned day. Go home, and I can sleep comfortable at night knowing I put my all into it. That's, like, the number one thing. So after seven years, I, I pulled the trigger and said, you know what? Uh, the company needed a revamping. I had never really allowed myself to have the time because we grew so fast. I mean, overnight in a blink of an eye, I went from being that kid that was doing wheels and tires and little spring installs to the guy that's taught, you know, I'm building engines. I'm building transmissions. I'm, I'm doing fuel systems. I'm producing four-digit cars, you know? And they're living and they're lasting a very fruitful life for the user of the end user of the vehicle. But the downside was I couldn't call myself a one-stop shop. I, I could not do that because I didn't have a dyno to, to, to do my, my calibration work. And now I'm not a tuner. I'll put that on record. I do not call myself a tuner. I'm not going to be a tuner. I've had people ask me. I work with a tuning company. I am the sole dealer in Southern California. 
There's one dealer I know of up in NorCal. It was a buddy of mine. But I'm the only dealer in Southern California for this company. And it took me about five years. Five years to earn their trust. Five years of showing them my commitment. Five years of working my butt off as a regular client to then have that conversation of, can I become a dealer? Can I present your product to the end user with the contingencies as it follows? We follow guidelines, right? And I follow those guidelines because I've, I've torn myself apart to earn that, that, you know, some people will throw themselves away for a hundred dollars. Yeah, no, I won't because you have to really bleed for, for, for it to understand how difficult it is to earn the trust of certain companies. Oh, and I know you do. Yeah. I know you do. And Caesar, I know you do as well. Um, and, and, um, uh, so I did that, and then I said, you know what, now's the time. So I revamped the company. I mean, last weekend, um, not this, this weekend from yesterday pretty much, but the mm-hmm. weekend prior, um, I shut the shop down for two, de- two days, and I called uh, 10 of my friends, my closest of clients that have become friends of mine, my buddies. I was like, look, I need a hand. I got to literally perform an exorcism in the shop, and I got to clean it. So we cleaned it from wall to wall and revamped the whole outlet of the nice. shop. Um, and, I mean, we tossed probably about like 4,000 pounds worth of just trash you know things that i i uh i had hoarded saying hey you know this axle is pretty good i'll just keep it, it might come in for, for handy for a rainy day or this drive shaft or this headlight and i was like i don't know the exhaust that you posted that was funny by the way <sighs> yeah. you know uh people actually came there the owners came and picked them up they got yeah. terrified uh that, that's another thing um and and it's more so my fault because i was never really strict on it and now i am if you have your car worked on Please, 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 for the respect of the shop, the, the the people that work there and the owner, pick your shit up. Pick it up, all right? Don't be lazy. Yep. Pick it up or turn around and simply say, hey, you know what? I, I'm, I'm not, I don't need it. I don't want it. That way the shop knows what to do. Because mm-hmm. I was in limbo for certain things. I had a transmission sitting there for two years, for God's sake. It was a broken trans. I, needless to say. So they're I, taking up space. Yeah, pick so it up. Still, Huh? No, he, after two years of asking and asking and asking and asking, he's, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get someone, I'm going to get someone, I'm going to get someone. And I understand you might've said, yeah, dude, I would have thrown it away in 30 days. I'm a very patient person. I have a, a, I have a very long fuse, but the problem with that fuse is when it's gone, like it's gone. Right. And you will see the worst of me in concept, but I was very patient with this individual. And eventually he just said, Hey, you know what? I, I'm not going to pick it up. I'm out of the country now. Like I don't need it. And I'm like, okay, goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. You know what I would have done? Just out of spite, but as a joke. And when the people came to pick up their exhaust or whatnot, hand them an invoice. Yeah, you know, there are shops that do that. Yeah, storage. Mm-hmm. There's sh- storage there, yeah. there are shops now that, like, for instance, if you don't pick up your, your, your car, stuff, right? and, and, uh, well, if you don't pick up your car within, say, 72 hours of it being completed, there's a storage fee. I respect 125 that. a day or something it depend, like that. Depends on the company. Some yeah. of them charge 35, some of them charge 125, yeah. 150, et cetera. But for parts, if you don't pick up your stuff within 30 days, a lot of companies say, it's mine now. Yeah. And then they'll turn it and they'll flip it and they'll sell it. Yeah. Right. Yep. Now, I understand I didn't do that. I've changed a lot of things in my company. My clients have a week. Once I'm done with the car, please come and pick it up because I don't want to go through the mental anguish that I went through. When I moved in the middle of COVID from my small shop to this 4,000 square foot shop, I had 14 days to paint the walls, do the bathrooms, do the electrical, get the air, airlines run, set everything up, and start working to make money because it cost me like $15,000 to move 100 yards, right, with painting and everything. So I didn't have the time to organize it. Now I, now I organize the shop, and the dyno gave me a reason to stop, rethink everything, and become another step better. My work quality is great, fine. I've said it, I'm not bragging, but it is what it is. But my shop looked like a shit show. Mm. My shop did not represent me. My shop did not represent the quality of the cars leaving my shop. And and it's not just about the quality of the work. It's about the presentation. Yep. It's like getting food. If it doesn't look good, you're going to say it, it's going to probably taste like crap. But it can taste like the most amazing thing in the world. You'll, but you're going to be hesitant to try it. But if it looks amazing, you're going to oh, that's going to be delicious. Well, that's kind of a two-sided dagger because it can either taste like crap or taste amazing and still look good at the same time the thing is you get the taste but it, the presentation wasn't there yeah and so i had to redo that now the dyno that's a different story seven years very emotional i called my wife up and sent her videos of the damn thing i mean we we almost flipped the forklift getting it off of the <laughs> truck i'm not joking that my, my next door neighbor brought this heavy duty fork. oh yeah this thing can move things six foot you know forks in a whole nine yards i'm like all right let's do this he picks it up 
and he pulls back and you just I'm like I yelled I'm like stop I'm not yelling at the bike but I was like stop and you just see the forklift literally tilt completely oh, forward and the only reason why he didn't flip the box or the forklift was because the truck was there the crate smashed into the back of the truck oh shit I didn't care about the crate I didn't care about the truck I was more like what's inside is important yeah, that's what matters <laughs> so we finally got got the the main um, two twenty four uh unit which is the roller the inertia roller in and that's six thousand pounds and then we got the eddy brake itself which is another two thousand pounds and then we've been you know between cars putting it together so you know I, my father-in-law came in he's an electrician he ran the electrical line for me and then me and the rest of my guys we've been putting it together and installing it the ramp show up on friday so i'm super excited about that because i'm doing above ground i did not want to dig a six thousand dollar pit into the ground of a property that i am leasing not even right? owning not even owning, no to only have to eventually move out of this property and then have to fill a $6,000 pit. Oh, that's going to be expensive. Yes, with concrete, of all yep. things. I didn't want to do that. So I bolted it above ground, got some nice 10-foot ramps that have a steady incline with um, some extensions, so even the lowest of cars can go on there. Now, Hondas. Hondas, Infinities, Nissans. Bags. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bag cars, and you just push it <laughs> exactly. up. You just lift it completely we don't have to up. Worry about no, that. the reason I said Honda is because of your old Honda. Oh, yeah, but that thing would have died just trying to get up the ramp. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I remember that car during the Panda Meets. My, you know, it's funny. Uh, we're talking about the Panda Meets. Uh, me and my wife were talking about it the other day. We were like, remember the old days we used to go to the Panda? But before Panda, do you remember what there was? Sorry to change the subject. No, 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 no. no. It, it, it's this is nostalgia, man. Yeah. Uh, it was the uh, Bob's Big Boy meets, man. Forget the Bob's Big Boy. Okay, okay. Before Bob's Big Boy, it was by Panda. Lancers? No, no. You remember the Stars Building right by the airport behind those buildings? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, those were old days. Though. We're talking two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Yeah, I mean, makes me feel old, but oh man, don't get me started. I, I, I mean. Those were the days. Those were the days when, when you know, you and your buddies would work on a car over the weekend or during the week, like afterwards and stuff. And then you'd go and you'd show off something like, "Oh, I just did these headlights," or "I just put these wheels on." And people would go like, "Your buddies would be like, dude, that's badass." It was the car show, but it was actually a car meet, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. A, it was just like you. You would get. We would only tell people that we trusted, mm -hmm. and then some group found out about it and, and destroyed the whole spot for us. But anyways, it was people we would trust and invite them in. But it was like you would have anywhere from 50 to 150 cars at a time. But it was like people would get out, you know, bring food, chill, talk. It was just cars. No drama. No that, drama. That, that was the thing. There was no drama. And then that, that group came in and kind of screwed it. They, they That's why we moved to Panda. Yeah. Well, they didn't kind of screw it. They royally screwed the pooch on that one. Yeah, they did. And then even with Panda. Panda was super cool. And then they got screwed. Yeah. You know, another group came in and ruined that. And then they went to Lancers. Remember when the, the management at Panda was like, you guys can't be here anymore. And yeah. we're like, even if we're purchasing, you know, we're buying food, Starbucks, they don't care. They didn't yeah, want it. They didn't want it. Anymore. So we went to Lancers and that got ruined too. The, the problem is people think that, oh, if they sit there and they rev the ever-living shit out of their car, they sound cool and they look cool and all this kind of stuff, or do a burnout or speed off and stuff, you might have 10, 15 guys go, oh, that's badass. The other 50 of us are like, you're a jackass. Yep. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a fool. I'll be one of those 50s. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I would laugh because every time I hear someone rev neutral rev a car, I'm like, hi, you're throwing the harmonics of that motor completely out of whack. Like, you have no idea the amount of shit that you're doing. Now, younger, I wouldn't have known this. As an experience working on cars, I go, or you're sitting there revving the crap out of it. Cool. Sounds cool for a minute or two, but right? But you don't know what you're doing to that car. But you're going to come and see me, and it's going to be a really expensive repair bill when your shit goes south. Or, you know, when they have those um, snap, crackle, pop, yeah, uh, flame stuff, right? Yeah. I'm not saying it in a bad way. Like, there <laughs> I don't are, have the flame map. There's a lot of guys that, like, they, they calibrate the vehicles to... Purposely. Uh, to purposely... Yeah snap, crackle, pop, or to shoot a 30-foot flame out of there where it roasts your neighbor's nutsack in the back, you know, through the window. The problem with, with, with all of that stuff when you're revving it and doing that is you're washing your cylinders out. Yeah. Okay? And, and if people don't know what washing a cylinder out is... It's burning the fuel up. Actually, so... In a lamer term. Yeah, yeah, but, I should say but even more so, right? So here, here's the biggest thing. Washing a cylinder out is you have two metal objects, okay? You have your cylinder wall and you have your actual piston mm -hmm. inside. And your piston, the cylinder wall has to be coated with lubricant, oil, 
all right? Well, guess what washes oil off? Fuel. And so when you start pushing a ton of fuel into that engine because you're sitting there beating the shit out of it, right? Right? You think you're sounding cool? Yeah. You're washing the lubricant. Do that one, one, for, one more time. For <laughs> We're going to turn that into a meme. Do it. Yeah, do it. Um, but what ends up happening is you, you wash the cylinder from lubrication. And uh, look, two, two, when, when a male and a female really like each other and they get together, that's a really sweet thing, right? But when two metal objects get together, it causes friction. And that's not a really good thing. You score the ever-living shit out of the cylinder walls and the pistons. And then you blow your shit up. Or yeah. you lose compression, and 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 or you're blowing smoke, and like you you can cause a lot of damage to a motor that way. Now I get it. Some shops would be like shops around here. They might well you don't know what you're talking about. I'm the calibrator. More power to you if you haven't had a failure. I'm speaking on behalf of the knowledge that I have on vehicles that I've worked on, on things that I've had to repair. I don't speak on behalf of anyone else. Yeah. Nor will I ever give myself the right to. Mm-hmm. I mean, a shop down the street could be doing something. I can know that's completely wrong. Cool. It's not my job. It's not my place. Now, that being said, remember how we were talking about how I give credit? Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a few people. Will over at RPG Engines in Madera, California. All right. He's in the top five. I consider him the best Ford engine builder in the nation. This guy is a brain and he's a mentor and a friend. When I have a question when I was building engines, I would ask him. Right. Uh, Nathan Cutler, he's up in Sonoma, California. He has a machine shop. Anything motor-wise you give this guy, like, he's a brain. And I've asked him questions. And the reason why I bring this up is as follows. The only way that this industry will survive is by passing on knowledge to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Okay? The issue I have, and this is where I'm going to get into it. Everyone has their head so far up their ass. And they're sniffing their own internals. And they think they're the hottest shit in the fucking planet. And you might be good at what you do and give yourself that credit, but stop being an egotistical fuck about it. I'm good at what I do, but I don't walk around like I got a fucking 10 foot long dick saying I'm king daddy of the street or king daddy of what I do. I'm good at what I do. My clients trust me. My new clients come and they, they like me and I earn their trust. And my biggest thing is they become my friends. Your clients need to trust you. What happens is when you have such a large fucking ego, your client ends up not trusting you. Absolutely. They're fearful of you. Mm -hmm. You might do good work, and that's the only reason why they're there, but they don't want to do anything with you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to know anything about you. You ask me about any of my clients, I'll tell you about their families, their friends, their kids, kid graduated, kid went to prom, et cetera. Why? I build that repertoire with my clients. I want them to know that I'm a human. I'm not a machine. And the same thing goes for the client. And... First thing first is you take that fucking giant chip you have off your shoulder. Come down about 52 notches. Calm the fuck down. A lot of of shops, a lot of owners, a lot of builders, a lot of techs, they think they're king daddy. It's okay to be prideful of what you do. You should take pride. Because if you're not taking pride in what you're doing, you're in the wrong field. Absolutely. You're in the wrong career. Change it. There's a very fine line between being an egotistical fuck that thinks they're the absolute best compared to everyone else and you're mean and you're rude, and you're selfish, and the opposite side. You're caring, you're understanding, and you're willing to educate. I teach people that are willing to listen. If you're willing to listen for me, I have nothing to hide. Nothing. Why? I will get my business. I'll make my living. But if I can pass on this knowledge to someone else, a younger kid, I might have just saved that kid from a bad household, poverty, giving him something willing to live for. I have a 17-year-old uh, kid. His name is Carlos. He's my apprentice, all right? And I don't say it in the sense of like, go get me food or go do this or go do that. I sweep the floors just like he does. I clean the bathrooms just like he's helped me. I do the oil changes just like he does. He's, he's an equal amongst men. There is no difference just because his term is apprentice instead of technician, instead of fabricator. I can guarantee you this. He's been working with me for two years. His dad's a good client of mine. I've built his dad's 01 Ford Lightning. I've built his dad's 14 GT. This kid has an 83 Fox Body SVO, the four-cylinder turbo. Yes. Badass car. So he's my apprentice. I'm teaching him pretty much everything, everything to do with, with cars. If I give him a car right now, he'll rack it, do the oil change, and he'll get it prepped for doing a clutch job. And he's 17. The reason why I have, I'm teaching him is because I don't have kids yet. 
eventually when I have kids, I'll teach my kids the same thing. If they're willing to get into this industry, they'll learn everything that their dad knows about, right? Just like, for instance, if your kid wanted to get into it, you would teach everything that you know. Yep. You want to, you want to pass that knowledge on. Right now, Carlos is that kid that I'm teaching everything that I know about. How to disassemble an engine, how to blueprint an engine, how to diagnose a problem, how to fix a problem. Like, those are the important things. And, and that's one thing that I feel that is lost within this industry. Um, big factor why I left I didn't like the fact that there is no realism anymore. Instagram, social media has made things so sugar-coated. Car comes in, bone stock. Boom, next reel. Car comes out, $50,000 worth of modifications. Looks badass. But no one knows the struggle, the late nights, the bashing your head against the wall, the parts that didn't fit, the companies that just are complete shit and don't want to help you out. They blame you instead of their product for it. I, I, I didn't care for any of that. Yeah, I'm very transparent. The companies I work with are good companies that I deal with, and that's it. I don't deal with anyone else. I don't want to deal with anyone else. Too many eggs in one basket, you'll lose that egg at the bottom. But if you can diversify it, cool. But it comes down to diversifying to proper companies. The The other thing is, um, that's pretty much it, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of was trying to like find out a few more things but like that's pretty much it is a lot of shops are egotistical fucks and, and, and they, they the difference between the pride and and, and uh, being an asshole it's not just you the know? shops it's the car owners too I mean <laughs> you it depends know. on the car owner but most of my clients 99% of my clients are actually very very down to earth like you oh, can talk to great. them blue collar white collar doesn't matter uh, the, my shop is an open community kind of concept right so it we are all equals amongst each other. There is no difference. You can come in with a hundred thousand dollars GT five hundred. You can come in with a thirty thousand dollars Ford GT. I don't care. You are an equal amongst each other. I I have thrown people out because they have been rude. I don't need that. I don't I don't deal well with that negative mentality, negative energy things. There's enough stress in this world as is. There's enough stress as being a man. There's enough stress as being employed, working, having to deal with that stuff. You don't need that extra crap on top of the Sunday. You want the cherry, not the oh, fucking yeah. Especially the garbage. cars. It's supposed to be your enjoyment. You know, you deal yeah, with. yeah. 100%. I mean, yeah, you're going to get stressed at certain things, but it's, you know, it shouldn't let it get to, to you too much. It's yeah. I, I mean, the way I've seen it is, you know, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what shop you are at, a lot of it falls onto the owner and a lot of it falls onto the customer itself. The way I see it, you know, sometimes owners start behaving the way a customer behaves and that's when they lose touch on who they are, who, what they can be, where they started, et cetera. I, I agree. I mean, it's very easy to get yourself lost in any field. Yeah. To get yourself, to, to lose your identity it, it, it's a very real thing. I mean, some people see it in movies, but it's it's true. You can lose your identity. I can tell you this. You know who you are. Yeah. You know who you are. I sure as hell know who I am. I know what I do for a living. I'm proud of what I do for a living. Nothing will ever change there. The only way that I will ever stop doing what I do is if I die or I'm forced to be shut down. That's it. I love what I do. I'm prideful of what I do. I wake up every morning with a smile on my face. Yeah, dude, I'm stressed. I, I, I lose a lot of sleep at night because I care so much about every one of those projects in my shop. I can list them. 1,400 horsepower twin turbo car I've had for a year. I'm building it from scratch. Customer got screwed on it. Bought the car thinking it was running. It's complete garbage. I've redone that car with my team. 69 Mach 1, Voodoo, swap. 92 Bronco, getting a full frame-up restoration. G8, 19 Mustang getting a new motor, 16 Mustang getting a new motor, uh, E36, yes, I do work on BMWs here and there, I got a single turbo E36, my buddy dropped off, I got to work on, I have a lot of cars like that, right, and I remember, and I remember every single car that I touch, it's, it's a curse and a blessing, it's a curse because I can't sleep at night, because I'm constantly thinking about things, I'm constantly pushing myself. I constantly want to be able to do better, right? So like, hey, what am I going to plan out for tomorrow? What am I going to do? My wife hates it. I come home and she's like, can you stop thinking? Can you shut that switch off and just have dinner with me and watch a movie? And I try my absolute best. There's days that I'm very successful at that. There's days that I just fall straight out on my face. But it's because I'm absolutely passionate about what I do. I care so much about it because once again, at the end of the day, the last thing that is left in this world is your legacy. And it, for us, it's what we do for a living. It's what I leave in this world with these cars. 
that you look at F- Boyd Connington. Uh, he passed away yeah. years ago, but you still hear his name. name. His projects are still there. You know, you do right, and you have nothing to worry about. You can sleep comfortable at night. Mm-hmm. But if you put your all into it, man, I'm telling you, there's no no better satisfaction than knowing like 50 years from now, if if these cars survive, because half of these are aluminum and plastic, to be honest with you. But 50 years from now, one of these collector cars, they will be a collector car. A 350R that I built it has my plaque built by PK Auto Design, serial number XYZ, right? And it's going to go in and it's going to get sold. And I might not be around. I might be long gone or I might be still around. But my legacy lives on within that car. Yep. You know, I look at these cars like my children. Each one of them. When it's, when it's sick, I want to care for it like a parent. When it's happy, I want to celebrate it like a parent. It's like graduation or having the flu kind of situation. <laughs> Some days they're throwing a bitch fit yeah. like a kid does, you know. Oh, always. But um, that that's the way I look at things. Uh, I, it might be weird. Some people might look at me like I'm crazy, but that's what that's how my gears turn, you know. It's that, that pride concept towards it. I get you. Passion, you know. Yeah. yeah. That, that's all it is. It, it's, it's, it's passion, you know. You, you take a concept, you produce it into a real-life thing. For a client, there's once again no other satisfaction to that. That's how it's supposed to be, True. At, at least in my eyes. Well, we agree upon that. A lot might say no, but to each their own. Everyone has the right to think. Absolutely. Some look. My wife thinks I'm the most beautiful man in the world. The girl next door might turn around and say he's the most ugliest guy in the world. Um, your wife is gonna watch this, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't. I mean. But my, my neighbor next door is seven years old. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> you know with some visual effects I'm gonna put Brad Fitt's face on him just so he, <laughs> that becomes reality. I'm just joking. Okay. No, no. I mean, it, once again, it's everyone. Everyone has the absolute right to to have an opinion. Absolutely, that is what gives you the the ability to be human and to have that freedom. Um, I I leave it with this, and I know we're we're running short on it. Allow everyone to to live the life that they want to live, unfringed. Um, allow everyone to be able to voice their concerns without forcing their their opinions onto others, and stop sliding, stop fucking doing sideshows. All right, please, please, stop. You want to do something? Look, man, Willow Springs has a has a burnout pit. They have a drift pit. It's We've an, said that multiple. It's times. an hour long away. It's an hour drive away. Go there, slide the ever living crap out of the car, host the meet, whatever you want. You can do it there lawfully and not have a problem. But Irwindale when you go to huh? Irwindale too. Irwindale has it too, right? Yeah. Irwindale has it. I, I think they, they some meats get covered up or like they, they produce meats and then you, they have burnout pits and stuff and you yep. can do that stuff. Like I can't get over it. Because I've had I've had law enforcement come in and ask me about it. At my facility, like not a client, like they've le- legitimately like walked in and be like, hey, we want to talk to you about th- this. Like, do you know any of these people? I don't know any of these people, uh, you know? Um, and the reason being is because someone had actually taken one of our license plates that's street racing and crashed and, and they had our plate on there. We had no association with that person. They had just, and that's another reason why I don't do car shows anymore. I used to give out free plates and everything, right? And I stopped because that guy literally took it and he, he got into a, an accident and flipped the car over. Luckily, no one got hurt. And it, my company was plastered all over social media, on CHP's website, their Instagram, the whole nine yards. And I was like, oh, great. What the fuck am I going to do about this now? And then they came and they talked to me about it. And I'm like, I have no association with it, which I didn't. Anyways. Hey, the way I see it is bad publicity is good publicity. <laughs> I'm gonna agree with you, but that still scared the ever living shit out of me. <laughs> hey, I don't. I don't think anybody likes cops walking into their shops and asking them questions. Uh, you know, I once again, I don't have a problem with them walking into my shop, as long as you're not there to hassle me, as long as you're not there to hassle my clients. I don't have a problem. You got to do what you do for a living. Absolutely, I do what I need to do for a living. Right? I support you. I have no problems with it. I respect law enforcement agents. Like I said, one of my best friends is a law enforcement agent. Every day he comes by, he comes by the shop. Great, and then he has to fly and go do things. And the, I get it. He's putting his neck on the line to do what he needs to do, and he's keeping us safe. Because, like, I'm gonna be honest with you, there's some bad people out there, really bad people. Oh, absolutely. He's like the boogeyman. He bumps back, right? And I respect that. What I don't respect is when we get hassled for things that we are not doing, yeah. where others are doing. 
you know, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I get the, the podcast that you've done, right, with the, the two law enforcement agents from Glendale Police Department. I think I've actually gotten pulled over by one of them, to be honest with you, for a modified exhaust. <laughs> I watched that, and I was like, oh, God, this is like reliving what happened last time. Um, He's like, that name sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, it did, actually. It, it, and, and um, you know, like, I, I get it. There's a time and place for everything, right? I have my modified exhaust, but I don't go barreling down Glen Oak Speedway and, you know, getting myself into trouble with it. Um, but yeah, I, I respect law enforcement. I have no problem with them coming by and saying hi. I do have a problem if they want to come and ca- cause me, uh, you know, stir the pot. Absolutely. I think that's with anyone. Yeah. Well, Paul, appreciate you for stopping by. I appreciate Thank you. you guys. Yeah, you know, I think I want to say this is actually probably my top three favorite episodes that we've ever filmed because i feel like i didn't have to do any talking oh i mean you you naturally put a talker on a podcast where you think it was going to happen but he's super uh, passionate about it It that's what it's about you know like you want to bring somebody that wants to talk not sit there and have to answer questions yeah even even though we don't by the way we don't script anything yeah yeah we everything just flows naturally this is i i will i will say it on record this has been completely just as the conversation progressively goes and i hope like they can people that are going to view this or or listen to it will understand because even with me, you know, I was going with one thing and then kind of like side noting another and then side noting another that you don't script that. This is a completely unscripted, uncensored thing, but I want to thank both of you guys. Appreciate you. Uh, One Sipan for, for inviting me onto this podcast. Thank you so much for having, having the, the, the interest and the trust within me to invite me onto your baby. And uh, I want to thank you for, Making this really fun. I mean, it was a hell of a conversation we had before we oh, started yeah, recording. Definitely. But nevertheless, I think you guys are doing a great thing. Appreciate um, it. True podcasts like this are far and few. And I listen to podcasts, uh, especially when I'm working. And they, they feel so just bullshitty. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, I get the top dog guys, right? And that's cool. But I'm talking about like, this is something attainable for, for the average guy like myself, where you've invited me here. And I'm, I'm, I may be locally known, but I'm not world renowned, right? And like, you just talk, you yeah. just talk. And I, I want to thank you guys for that because it's super cool being able to actually have a conversation with fellow car guys, or and if you guys ever have a girl on a car, girls, right? And and just shoot the shit and talk about what's in your mind and in your heart and in your gut and and, and no holds bar kind of concept. So I, I really do like it. I mean, this won't be the last time, so. No, I mean, whenever you guys want to invite me, no problem. Um, when I get the dyno up and running, I'll, I'll, I'm going to host a gathering at the yes. shop. I'd like to invite you guys over. We'll be there. Um, I don't know how many people will come, but it's definitely going to be something cool. We can, you know, put the cars on the dyno and run numbers and sure. and we'll do a little barbecue and stuff. Blog so definitely. Today. Huh? You'll vlog today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys, are, and you'll be able to see the shop uh, oh, yeah. in all of its uh, 4,000 square foot glory of uh slightly broken vehicles <laughs> being ripped. trust the process guys trust, trust the, the process, process. <laughs> uh, so no once again appreciate you appreciate the invite thank you so much we appreciate you and uh, i look forward to uh, if you guys ever invite me back i'll definitely have more uh, good stories or horror stories because i'll, I got I'll take all of them yeah i'll take all of them I, I, I got a ton of stories man i i, I mean next time around i'll tell you about things that like i have found in cars you, you know i want to do an episode where we can actually have one, two, three, four more mics. Actually, no, yeah, four, yeah, four more, more mics. mics. And that way, we can invite for a couple of more people and just do bloopers of horror stories in their shops and shit. That would be funny. You want to? I got, I got a ton. Do we have any background camera security footage that we can post? Up? Okay, so uh, I we'll sign. Let's not say anything. We'll sign an NDA and then move on from there. So we can blur everything out. No, not not about the customer cards. The customer cards are one thing. I, you were talking about background. I have a video of me falling through the roof. I, I want that. <laughs> can you send that in? Yeah, it's going to be the intro video. I'll yeah, I'm going to make that the intro video. <laughs> actually, if, if, if I can find it, I'll, I'll send it to you. But I legit have a, a photo of me falling through my, my mezzanine in my old shop. Um, I was trying to grab a set of wheels and I slipped and just went straight through the cardboard. And, and yeah. Yeah, it it seems like if he's it. falling and landing in this chair. It, I, I don't it, know why it's funny, I but it's funny. I fell into a chair. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps getting better. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs>